Clay, before we start our uh, tacking into the wind conversation, we should mention mm. that Rene Auberjonois passed away a couple of days ago, which will yeah, very date, sad. date this podcast a little bit or at least give you an idea of where we are. But um, I guess we just wanted to uh, – I just wanted to kind of open it up with a um, – Despite, you know, the writing kind of failing Odo uh, and him, I think later on in the series of this, I think he's probably one of like the top three or five Star Trek actors of all time. Um, very versatile. Did mm. a, a thankless role for Odo where... I mean, he can even, he can turn into a bucket. That's right. He can, he can play any part. <laughs> you can also, you know, you're hidden under piles of latex. Um that really limit what you can do with everything. But it's still, at the same time, he managed to make Odo extremely evocative and like did a lot with his body language and just like the whole package of physicality that you have to do is that kind of character. Mm. But he really um, elevated Odo to something. And I think he's, uh, he was by all accounts a really nice guy. And he seems like he's probably one of my favorite actors across the whole franchise. Yeah. He, you know, he managed to take a, a part that I think could have been, um, fairly unengaging or or difficult to get make relatable because of how much uh, la- uh makeup there was and he really found a way to to break through it i mean even you know it, it it covers up his face and it covers up a lot of his eyes he can't really do a lot of eye acting which is really important and he managed to get across odo's character through body language but most importantly through the his voice and his tone yeah and um you know i think that's the mark of a, of a great actor and i think he's he's definitely one of one of the uh one of the greats and i my, i don't have i don't really have a uh an anecdotal story about him but i was at a <clears throat> at a comic-con not too long ago and i walked by the autograph area and uh there was maybe three or four star trek people there and he had the longest line. Hmm. I, I I don't know if th- that doesn't mean anything, obviously, but I just it it seemed like he was he was beloved by a lot of people. Yeah, um, he, he gets um well, he gets a lot of um. I've seen a lot of comments on Twitter and Instagram of just about he was always uh, in a way that a lot of actors aren't at those things. He was always positive with people, like very friendly yeah. about being there. Yeah. Yeah, and I honestly I could tell that just by walking by too. You know, he was standing up, he wasn't sitting at his ta- at the table and he was really engaging with the people he was talking to and you know, by all account not that I ever knew him, but by all accounts it seems like he was a great guy. Yeah. So, sad to see him sad to see him pass. Um it's been a lot of just Star Trek related passing recently, which is a very strange kind of like coincidental thing, but it is uh it is a sign of everyone getting older and the show is older at this point. He was surprisingly He's Patrick Stewart's age, which is shocking. Mm. They they just don't look yeah. anything like each other in terms of what their ages no. are. Yeah, yeah. Well, millions of dollars will do that to you, I guess. <laughs> so, but uh, thank you very I much. I would like to say, though, I would like to say, I mean, it's not really that big of a loss if you think about it, because when they get back together and do the reunion, they can just cast somebody else to play Odo because he can look like anybody. So, That's true. Yeah. They'll why are we up. even talking about this? Is they'll, what I'm getting around to. You know? <laughs> they'll cut up the. Um, South Park chef thing. We'll just take his lines and cut them up into like a new thing when you lose the actor and you just keep going forward with new content. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Just Renee. bring, bring, bring Jed Zia back and have, uh, Esri's actress just wear the Odo makeup. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Renee Albergenois. You did, you did great. It was a good career and yeah. uh, it's sad to see you go, but you left quite a legacy behind. So let's get into tacking into the wind. It is the next episode of DS9 that we're going to be covering, but first you're going to hear some music. Accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints. Just people. Tacking into the wind, it is the 22nd episode of the seventh season, aired on May 12th, 1999. Written by Ronald Moore, directed by Mike Vahar. In this episode, Gowron begins reckless attacks against the Dominion. Kira and the Cardassians plot to steal a Breen weapon. So here we are, Clay. This is a um mm. a second one. This is a this is such a Ron Moore script. I think in a lot of ways, like it's it obviously deals with the Klingons, which were his kind of speciality. But I think that it's just I, I once you've seen so many of these scripts, I think the writers start to stick out to you. Where uh, Ron Moore likes these kind of Shakespearean dramatic character 
interactions with each other where the scenes are two mm-hmm. people sort of like squaring off against each other. And this one is mm-hmm. chock full of those scenes. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's one omission from this episode that I really think is what gives it a leg up. Um, but, uh, this episode I've been, I've been hard on this run, this final run, but I feel confident in saying this is not only the best episode of the final run, I think it's the best episode of the season. Mm, that's big praise. And You're going bold with your your take on this one. Yeah, it's it it is front to back. None of the scenes are wasted. Every scene has a purpose. Every scene moves forward character relationships, and uh, it reshapes the status quo of what's going on. It's just it's a it's a really really good episode. I think it's um. The, my main takeaway is I, I think I would expand on that, and I'd say it's even bigger than that because what this one does is it ties off, essentially ties off to, it gives a thesis statement about two stories that have been going since TNG. You have the mm-hmm. Worf and the Klingon Empire story, mm-hmm. which which kind of ends here. This is like the end point of that story. And you also have the... Cardassian and Bajor interaction, which basically started in TNG with the Ensign Row episode. It's where they introduced the idea that, that this had mm-hmm. all happened and DS9 uh, expanded on it. But it's um it's a pretty it's almost I think maybe one of my main criticisms of this one would be that if it ties into the arc in any way, it's like why couldn't they have done more episodes that built off of the Klingon stuff leading into this as opposed to four episodes of Wynn and Ducat sitting around with each other? Well, yeah. I, I, I mean, feel there's just the... so much meat on this bone <laughs> that you could get into. And if anything, I'd say I don't I don't think it feels rushed, but I, I would have rather even one more episode of Gowron, Martok, and Worf debating what's going on or sort of getting at each other would have been something I think much more rewarding than what we got for the four that led into this. After Martok has softened their defenses... No. We cannot attack Zapridian. I decide what can and cannot be done. You rule without wisdom and without honor. The warriors that are gathered here would not say this to you, but I will. You are squandering our ships and our lives on a petty act of vengeance. I should have known better than to trust you again. If you were a true Klingon, I would kill you where you stand. Fortunately for you, that child's uniform shields you from your rightful fate. Yeah. Um, obviously, the thing I was speaking of that is missing from this that gives it a leg up is that there is zero... Kai Wynn and Ducat stuff yeah. in it. Uh, so there's like no downtime. What's <laughs> the gone. closest you get to the closest you get to downtime in this is the Bashir and, and O'Brien stuff. And even that stuff is pretty good. Yeah. Which is very um, simple, but it's just them setting up. But just to cover it, it's just them setting up the trap that they're going to lure Section 31 to the station. Sure. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, obviously I would, would I prefer more? Would I prefer stuff other than the Kai Wynn and Ducat stuff? Yes, I would. Um, but I honestly don't know if adding more would have been that beneficial because how many times can you really do what they do in four scenes in this episode? You know, like how many times can you really have Martok and, and Worf side eye each other over Gowron's questionable tactics? You know, Mm -hmm. um, I feel like they lay it out pretty pretty uh tightly in this where you set it up at the beginning with cisco and gowron and cisco getting in gowron's face and gowron you know making it clear what his intentions are sure and arguably towards... it's, been, it's been running since the previous episode too when gowron arrived at the station right yeah right uh you know you've got gowron essentially giving you all of his 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 uh position on his power and on martok and then you've got uh the scene with Worf and Martok where they talk about that stuff and, you know, you get that moves it forward there. Then I think, I can't remember if there's another scene. I, oh, the scene where uh, Worf talks to Esri, which even that two, three episodes ago would have been a throwaway scene, but is is great mm-hmm. because Esri just completely skewers the entire Klingon ethos, which I thought was awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it, and it wraps up with the most, uh, with the only person being the the only one who can move the Klingon Empire forward is Worf because he is not of the Klingon Empire. And right. it, it's 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 great. I thought it was awesome. 
Yeah, it's. Um, I just don't know if they exp- if they expanded that for three more episodes. I feel like you'd be kind of running in place, you know. That's true. I I think that if you're gonna, I think you could criticize the pace and just say that Gowron is one of those characters. I think that you could have brought in at the very opening arc, like he makes his decision to come to DS9 at that point, mm-hmm. and he he more slowly usurps. Martok sure in that sure. place and I think that you yeah. could have scenes where Gowron actually goes out there with the best of intentions but becomes because Martok has a couple victories it kind of Gowron comes around to the realization that this guy is potentially going to be a threat to him down the line mm-hmm. instead they bring Gowron in knowing full well that that's the case of what's happening so I, I feel you could not necessarily you don't need to add things but if just the the pacing of the episodes was improved where even just one scene in each episode building off of this stuff for the past mm-hmm. four episodes would have, in my opinion, strengthened the final arc as a whole. Because I think that the Klingons' involvement in the war is so important that having them be there for a longer stretch to really lay out and remind the audience of who Gowron is and what all the interactions are with Worf and everything mm-hmm. like that, I, th- I think it would be helpful. But as you say, I think it's pretty much perfect in terms of these two episodes they get all the points across that they need to and they make all the connections that they need to and i think it's a it's a fitting end to the wharf storyline whereas you're saying he's the only person who could do this what needed to be done because martok yeah. is the good uh, quote-unquote klingon martok mm-hmm. does what klingons are expected to do he's never going to um challenge gowron in that way even though he knows what gowron is doing to him he still is like i'm a warrior i have to do what we have to do but Worf, being outside of that wearing the child's uniform uh which is a great little quote is the only one who's able to step up and finish off gowron and it's actually not a bad fight scene between the two of them at the end it was it was surprisingly good uh they they definitely uh were covering up some stuntmen by shooting it artistically through like those schematics and stuff yeah but i thought i thought once they cut away from the actual actors and they're like okay let's let the stunt guys do their thing i thought it was actually really good yeah uh probably yeah one of the better klingon wharf definitely fight scenes i was thinking about Worf, um, Worf stabs him at the end right would I, I was wondering if you strengthen the story even a little bit by um maybe not strengthen it but I was I was wondering if Gowron got the upper hand and Worf had to kill him in a kind of underhanded, dishonorable way just to make sure that Gowron wasn't around anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't do that. They kind of go the opposite where Worf respects Gowron at the end and gives him the death yell, a better death yell than he gave his wife, I think. Yeah. <laughs> in all yeah. Actuality. But he respects Gowron enough to do that for him at the end. And it's kind of the show admitting that Gowron is not really a villain in this situation. It's just Worf had to do what he had to do right. to make things right. Right. And I, I, I just love that they use... They they exploit the paradox of, of Klingon... Um, they exploit the paradox of the entire Klingon thing through Gowron and Martok, where Gowron is using the... Klingon ethos of like honor and and never turning down a battle in order to you know uh bring himself up politically and and uh you know put put a political hit out on Martok essentially. Yeah. Martok can only survive so long with the way that he's being expected to act for it. Yeah, yeah, because because it is this circle of, you know, the the they send you into war and because you are a good Klingon you have to answer that battle call despite whether or not you think it's the right thing to do blah 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 blah. And just exploiting that paradox and then using Worf, who for his the in, the entirety of both of these series has been removed from the Klingon Empire and the Klingon uh, way of life as much as he wants to get back into it. Uh, he finally realizes that in order to really do the best thing for, for, for the Klingon people, he has to destroy it. It's just – it's awesome. It's great. It's, it's a it's a long – I mean, Worf's um... – Worf's interesting because I would never say that Worf is like a top tier Star Trek character. I don't think. I, I think you could argue that, but I guess it's more instinctual and on a gut level. I don't really treat him that way. However, mm-hmm. his arc is fairly spectacular for yeah, this really franchise is. in terms of what it did. Because back in like I think it was Redemption of TNG or something like that, he actively argued against removing the current Klingon government, even though it was the same thing. And mm-hmm. he very like. He very organically came around on that point of view while still being Worf, while still being the the character who, like, 
he might have given up on his dreams of of thinking that the Klingon honor system and whatever is like the the top of the uh, the heap, or it's like the best thing that he wants to attain. But it, it, while he flipped around on his perspective of things, he still remained kind of the same character who has to he has to do what the other Klingons can't do for the good of the Empire. Like he takes a disincommodation and sins of the father. He does that for the good of the Empire. He kills Gowron here for the good of the Empire, and it, it's just an interesting. It's an interesting arc for that character. It's it's the thing that Darren always says when he comes on about how when characters come into the Federation, they're changed by the Federation as opposed to the mm-hmm. other way around. Mm-hmm. And and Worf seems at this point where all the other discommendations and stuff were like a sticking point and like a, a thing that he felt uh, regretful or sad about. This doesn't feel that way. He feels like he's come full terms with what he had to do and him being the only Klingon who could actually go about doing things like this. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just a really great uh you know, it's it's a great character arc that they really land and they don't actually bring a ton of attention to what exactly is going on here. Um like it's not it's not played in this grand dramatic well, obviously there's a the fight to the death, but like there's it's not this grand dramatic moment where uh you know uh, He's not. He's not holding the detonator for the bomb inside of Kronos. It's uh, not in, in front the, of the in front General of the, Assembly. Yeah, it's not you in front know, of the yeah. Klingon Empire or anything like in a uh, Coliseum type. Setting. It's always funny. It's in a DS9 conference room. <laughs> Obviously, it's yeah. budget related, but it's a very small setting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I as the fight was happening, I was thinking like, what if someone's just walking by and just wants to dip their head in and go, "Oh shit!" Or like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, the like admin was, bringing in the coffees I, for them. Yeah. I kind of wasn't expecting it to go to the death because I that setup to me felt like okay this is the point where Cisco comes in and is like what's going on here we can't be fighting amongst you know that kind of thing yeah well I I, um, I was surprised they didn't Cisco basically gives Worf a wink wink do what you have to do here yeah at the beginning which they which I I think doesn't really land because you think Cisco's just telling like Worf in very firm terms go talk to Gowron and do something but mm-hmm. Cisco I think at the beginning is playing Worf knowing what has to happen here. There's only one way that Gowron disappears from this problem. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's a need to uh, uh Cisco is just being like I I don't want to know just make it happen, yeah. you know. Yeah. Did um Yeah, it's um it is it is so it, you know for for you're saying it's uh Ron Moore's stuff it tends to be like kind of operatic and shakespearean which it is but again it's inside the conference room on deep space 9 it's not like it's not like Ramirez versus the Kurgan on the steps of a crumbling castle or something you know it's like <laughs> it's still oddly oddly diplomatic in its setting and it's very small for such a big thing and i i loved it i thought it was great yeah and um just to pray cuz Gowron is gone at this point which is always kind of interesting to say in a star trek series that a character is no mm. longer with you anymore i i assumed he wasn't going to be dead I just assumed he was going to be badly hurt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> until until they did the cling. I mean, the the plus side of the Klingon thing is once you do the death yell, that character's not coming back. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I so uh, up until that point, I was like, oh yeah. I mean, he got stabbed in the stomach. You can survive for a while from that. You know, and, maybe and he's you- just taken out of commission for a while. But <laughs> they don't have the. Uh- the Irishman scene of getting rid of the corpse. You know what I'm talking about? I won't say any spoilers, yes, but you yeah, don't have that kind yeah. of a scene. Wait, which one? There's like three of them. <laughs> yeah, well, though, any of them. I think they all they all work yeah. fairly effectively. Uh, yeah, I think that... And I just want to kind of remind you that this is outside of the episode itself, but th- d- what we're approaching is basically the latest Star Trek that we ever see in the mm-hmm. universe. Like, there's an, in this prime universe, th- we're... The end of DS9 is basically the end of what's known about the Star Trek universe and the timeline. Oh, really? Is it the the end of Deep Space Nine is is past Voyager? Well, Voyager doesn't take place in the Alpha Quadrant at all, so you don't oh, okay. you don't right, see right. any okay. of the outcomes sure. of this. Sure. Um, and it was it ran a couple of years past it, but the last episode of Voyager, not everyone knows, Voyager gets home, but you don't spend a tremendous amount of time home with Voyager. Sure. Right. Right. Uh, so this is really like. This is the latest that the timeline ever goes. So Gowron not being around, like I guess it's it hits me on a level of it's quite a wrap up for a lot of uh, the franchise beats. Like the, it's a it's a wrap up to the Klingon story, and I think that mm. it's 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 impressive for being that final with it. Yeah, I and it's 
it's impressive in its structure to me coming off of the first two or three episodes where you're arguably wrapping up Cisco's arc, but then spending time arguing about food and, and mm-hmm. like marital chores and shit. And it's like you go from that, which is you're kind of wrapping up this big thing that's been there since the beginning. And then you're just hanging around with it, spending time, not really advancing anything, just doing it to do it, I guess, versus this where it's like you are moving forward. Like there is there's not really any room at least i don't think at any uh, next episode who knows we'll, we'll see gowron's son I, comes back yeah, he's like I but am yeah now, but yeah. there's no like you know you you have the the removal of gowron plus Worf is giving the leadership to martok so there's not really a lot of room for like pussyfooting around the consequences of this right it's like it's whatever yeah. yeah, it's a it's a status quo change, and whatever happens next is only going to move it forward. I, unless they spend the next four episodes arguing about whether or not Martok being in charge is the best idea. No, which Mar- I, hopefully <laughs> is not what they do. <laughs> Martok is the chancellor from this point on. Okay, um, good. Yeah, they. they I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree with that it's just it's interest. It's a it's a stake changing. I think it's just because it ties into what's been most interesting about DS nine where the profit stuff is not really interesting because it's so vague and meaningless. Mm -hmm. And it's just a bunch Mm -hmm. of words, spaghetti that they throw at you. The Klingons we've been with and like DS nine, as we've said, has always done the politics of this show pretty well. And Mm -hmm. just having one of the powers shift like that. And I think that's a good place as any to jump to the other part of this episode that I really enjoy. But the Cardassian plot basically mirrors this in a lot of right. ways, where both of right. them are about characters coming to terms that the empires that they both once knew and sort of grew up with and were raised in and molded by are no longer possible in this new world uh, because of the Dominion War and because of like just the characters coming to terms with what it, mean, what it means to be the, in the Federation and have the Federation values. I like the... um. I think Damar in the Cardassians is executed slightly less well than the Klingon stuff, but I still like it on some level because I think maybe Damar's point is a little bit redundant because we know that Damar is at this point, and I don't think there's any surprise. They try to hide it as well they can who he shoots at the end, but there's no question as to who he's he's going to shoot in that situation. The only the the best part about that storyline I think is the um aesthetic uh setup of it where the Cardassian, the three Cardassians, the general, the underling Garrick and Damar, all have like a Mexican standoff with each other, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I just think that that's it's really well thought out. It's the the underling is pointing a gun at the Bajoran that he hates because he wants the old way. Garrick sneaks up behind him in a way that mm-hmm. only Garrick can and holds a gun on him oh, and says Garrick, that you. What's Garrick that? is so good. Garrick is so good in this episode. Like best and best, I'll, I'll just best use of Garrick in like two seasons. <laughs> And Garrick sneaks up behind him and says, you don't know me, because he's been changed by what he's gone through. And then mm-hmm. Damar is the decision maker about which way that the rest of the Cardassian Union is going to go. And while I don't think it's as clean or uh, like perfect as the Car- uh, as the uh, the Klingon stuff, I do like the Cardassian stuff at the end. I think it's a nice little uh, thematic match to what goes on with the Klingons. Yeah, I, you know, I, I even though it's more or less kind of the same idea uh from a from a large view um yeah if you're looking at it from a large view yeah I, it's probably a little bit less uh less in doubt as to what the outcome is going to be but i found the uh the meat of that was really the uh damar and cardassians as bajorans parallel and the all of that inner working and and how like the guts of it are churning around, not so much the the way it ends up coming out with you know Mexican stand out that's fine, but like the the guts of it all churning around with that scene where Demar's fam- fucking family gets killed, yeah, which was and then and then Kira says like yeah, what kind of people would do it? that was fantastic, I thought that was awesome, yeah, like, all of that stuff I thought was great um the the standoff with the the underling and Kira. And then Garrick comes out of the shadows and he and with his gun drawn and tells her that, yeah, you're probably going to have to kill that guy. And then he just fades <laughs> back in the shadows. That was amazing. I thought that was great. I just, you know, Garrick being consistent in that 
Odo tells him that he's dying, and Garrick's like, oh, yeah, I won't tell anybody. And then he immediately tells Kira. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then Kira being like, yeah, I fucking know. This, the Kira in this episode is the Kira that I miss. This is the Kira that I wish had been there for the entire seventh season. Yeah. Because she's the, – the way that they write her in this relationship in this episode almost makes up for everything they've done up to this point, but it doesn't because she's not in most of these episodes. Yeah. Because I- she manages to – Show how much she loves Odo, but also not sacrifice her core beliefs as to like what she's doing in the moment and getting the job done and everything. And that is so much more believable as to how she she would be in in this relationship and situation than them just like you know, hold you know, playing fingers finger you know, playing finger footsie yeah, and, and at Quarks while they're watching you know, uh, uh, the Bashir do something silly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they I'll get back to that because I think there's something about their relationship that I would fundamentally change, but I think that the um I I agree. I think Odo is also good in this because Odo has an mm. Odo line that I don't think I've heard him say in a very long time where Garrick finds out that he's sick and a uh, hey, Odo has a line of if I don't want the pity from the woman I love, what the fuck do I care about your opinion yeah. basically? Yeah, that's a good line. Which yeah. is which is really good, a really Odo thing to do. And I, I think I like the fact that like Garrick super spy who knows everything also doesn't quite understand the love between those two because he doesn't see that Kira knows it already, mm-hmm, which, which I mm-hmm. think is nice. And the, I, I think that their relationship fundamentally, I think the problem with their relationship is that I kind of, I wish they weren't in a relationship. I yes. guess like, I don't know if putting Kira in Odo in a romantic relationship that isn't just sort of a, deep bond of friendship slash love that doesn't turn into them just going on dates for most of the seventh and sixth seasons. (laughs) I think that's a, I just, I would have the same impact from the story if they weren't like officially, you know, quote unquote, officially together as a couple. Would you you agree with that? Yeah. I, well, I think it goes to what I was saying. I've said before, I said this when they first got together is I wish they didn't get together until the end of the show. You know, I wish that they had that tension still there um, and you can you can still do this episode and and have them have this love for each other or whatever, but just not and not have it be the relationship love that they've been in up to this point. Yeah, uh, because it feels like them them getting together is the end of that story, be- as we've seen from the last two seasons where <laughs> once they get together, <laughs> they just fall off the map. Yeah. And, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm surprised this episode wasn't. Odo going into the holodeck and going, Vic, I'm I'm dying. There's no way I can tell her that I'm dying. And Vic being like, hey, man, you know, she'll understand. She's a hip chick. Just tell her what's going on. Everything will be cool, daddy You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'll invite her to dinner and I'll tell her while my face falls off. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, you know, it's it's I, I, I totally agree where it's like the the fact that they are in like a committed relationship feels kind of weird and i don't think it's necessary for this moment i mean it it still works i mean it it works fine but it does yeah uh, i'm talking more of a a general sense not just this episode yeah yeah Yeah, them being in a committed relationship has just always felt weird to me because you know they didn't know what to do once they put them together so yeah i mean it's it's just kind of the argument against like it's like there's always this argument about like you hear from certain uh, conservative circles like they're, they're like we need to increase the marriage rates like marriage is mm-hmm. important everyone needs to get married but mm-hmm. it kind of misses the point that marriage is easy but relationships are hard like sure anyone can get married and it doesn't yeah. mean that you're gonna have not have more, you're not gonna have more broken upset uh, like bad families just because marriage rates are up. So the president thinks marriage is so important that he's done it three times. <laughs> That's right. You get, you get better with each time, I suppose. Yeah. Or you, you hit the uh, escape button a little bit faster each time, too, I think. But that, I think that's the problem with it. Like, the, the, mar- the, the relationship slash marriage in and of itself isn't meaningful in any kind of story way. It doesn't tell you what works about their relationship at all or what doesn't mm, work about right. it. And I think that they – I think the writers just got lazy and did approach it as if it was an end of their story together yeah. instead of – really 
they could even be open with each other and know each other's feelings about it. But just because you are in the relationship doesn't mean they have to do these date storylines and keep this tension going. And it doesn't change at all the impact of what happens here at the end. If they're not in a relationship, this story plays out exactly the same way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that, that love that they have for each other is there regardless of whether or not they're sleeping together. Or yeah. Whatever, you know? Yeah. Or I mean, Hey, maybe they are sleeping together and they're just trying to, they're still weird about it. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it, it's, I, it's just it is, something. It's one of Some, those, something to do yeah. for those two. Yeah. It's one of those weird things where it's like, I feel like when you've got that, will they, won't they thing going on, once they get together, it kind of breaks your story. And you kind of start scrambling for things to do with them. And the, I, I know we've talked about this before. The first thing on the, on the list is, okay, I guess we have to break them up now. You know, like, uh, the show new girl, which was, is, you know, fantastic show. Um, the main plot of new girl or the main thrust of new girl is that, you know, one of the guys in the, in the loft is falls in love with Zoe Deschanel and they keep like skirting around it in these really awkward ways because they realize once they get together, it kind of breaks the the whole engine of the show, kind of. Yeah. Yep. And then they finally do get together, and then they break them up almost immediately because it's like, well, what the fuck are we going to do now if they're together? You know, it, it kind of destroys the whole dynamic. Same with, uh, same with the X Files. Friends is the same Friends, way too. Ross the X Files. Yeah. Somehow Cheers managed to get around it. Uh, I kind of. In the, just because uh, Sam and Diane are both really bad at relationships, yeah. So them getting together is ultimately going to cause them to to split up, and it it's not will they will they or won't they get together. It becomes will they or will won't they stay together, which yep. is a completely different dynamic. Like with the Office, Pam yep. and Jim finally get together. Thank God. Th that's the one where I was like. I think they realize that if they fuck with this, it's going to break everything because they got them together and then they just allowed them to more or less have a happy marriage. It didn't remove them from the stories at all. Yeah. But it, it just was like, you know, what what if for once we don't break up this couple everyone wants to see together? And then in the last season, when they tried to like hint at that, it felt really, really off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the British one ended the series with them getting together, which seems mm -hmm. like a natural point. Uh, I, the U.S. office, yeah, obviously didn't screw up that dynamic. They kind of, you just have to create other things to distract you from the fact that it doesn't exist anymore. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with the office to really say whether or not it changed the characters in any well, kind of way, but it, it didn't really because they actually kind of, they, they, they got around it by just be, because they were sort of less than, um, I won't say they were less than the main characters after they got together, but they shifted the the uh, the approach a little bit and allowed them to do stuff inside of what their relationship and marriage would be, which is stuff that everybody would usually have to go to. Like instead of breaking them up, Pam got pregnant, yeah, and so then they got all of the you know the drama and wackiness that comes from that. So like they managed to do it without sacrificing the the initial get together, yeah. If there's enough of a uh, ensemble, you can replace the main conflict with something else and sort of sure. rebuild from there. Yeah. I think the the failure, the failure comes from something like DS9, where just treating that as a solution to a problem isn't good enough. You kind of have to like fill the void with something. Yeah, because in DS9, Odo and Kira getting together is not the story for either of them. Like right. that's not built in from the beginning. The way the Pam and Jim thing or the Sam and Diane thing is. It's that was something that was tacked on later. So if you are uh, ending their stories with them getting together, you're sacrificing what their stories actually were. Yep. For the sake of you know, if you're if you're kind of if you're looking at your story circle kind of thing here, uh, you're you're stopping their story at the bottom when they're at their most comfortable, even though that point is only halfway through their the main story that they're on. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think Kira still has to come to terms with uh, the the Cardassian stuff and her place in the in the Bajoran play, you know, become a Starfleet, all the kind of stuff that they're getting into now. She still has to come to terms with that stuff. It's not just, oh, she finally found love. I guess we don't have to use her anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll have more to say with, about those two when the uh, the series wraps, I think, and then the, into the finale and everything like that. But it is it was refreshing to see them get back to it in this episode and just feel like the characters who were there 
a couple seasons ago, <laughs> and not, mm-hmm. not the yeah. love, not the love smitten two that I've I've grown to not really enjoy uh, the characterization that they did at that point. But it's been it, it's good. It, they're a nice they're a nice plot to mix in on that side and just have it be like the relatable stakes of what's going on while you have the the greater operatic thing of Damar holding a gun at people and stuff like that. But I think. Mm-hmm. I think the reason I really like this one, and I think this is the best of the... I, I think this one builds off of the previous episode, which I also think is very good, but the, it's more the show is doing the story properly at this point, after a little bit of a false start. It's just that um, this one is wrapping up what I consider to be the more important, impactful arcs that the series has gone into, which is... Basically, the war storylines and how, like, mm-hmm. the politics of the Alpha Quadrant have changed since the start. Mm-hmm. And, you know, leave the profit stuff alone for the, for the majority of it. Yeah. I think they just, I think well, they have the priority backwards about what they consider to be the important parts of ending the series. Oh, 100%. And the thing that, that I love so much about what they're doing in this episode and how much they're changing things, you know, as far as, the Klingons and the Cardassians and, and the approach to everything. I mean, Christ, even section 31 uh, is they're treating the dominion the way that they should have treated the Borg. Like if the Borg show up, that is a status quo shattering thing. It shouldn't just be, Oh, the Borg show up. We've defeated the Borg. Nothing needs to change. You know, like that's, that's a, a world ending uh, 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 you know, star po- potentially Starfleet destroying event is the Borg showing up. Right. So the fact that they treat the Dominion that way, where in order to defeat the Dominion and win this war, they have to fundamentally change all of these, for lack of a better term, kingdoms. Yep. And uh, uh, and their relationship to each other and everything is just it's it's really ballsy. To, to actually take that step forward in a way that that's what that's what makes it so much different than all the other Star Trek shows is they're not at this point. They're not afraid to be like, all right, we're actively going to push things forward instead of just going back onto the episodic reset. Right. And just keeping uh, the Klingons and the Cardassians the same and everything like that. It would it would have largely been impossible to do that. And I think they're they're fairly effective at showing the change. It is just a it is a point of view of the other races coming around to the federation's point of view which is more that just like the 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 greater good is more important for things like this like the Mm -hmm. the other cultures are a little bit more insular in that they have racial traits or whatever that kind of uh keep them on the the like the straight and narrow or at least like kind of boxed in where the the cardassians were the um authoritarian sort of big brother agency the kind of nazi Mm -hmm. stand-ins and the klingons Mm -hmm. are obsessed with honor and everything like that but in order for the existential threat of the Dominion to be dealt with, the cultures do have to adapt to basically what the Federation's point of view has been since the start, which is the, which is why it's still a Star Trek series. Like there is mm-hmm. no cynicism about that. It's the other the other aliens are coming about to what it means to be human in some way or to have hu- share human values, and they're effectively wrapping up the story by bringing those uh, things home at this point. And the, the Alpha Quadrant obviously will never be the same after the Dominion War ends. Too mm-hmm. many things have changed. And, you know, not to not to open up this can of worms, but I feel like what they do in this episode specifically, uh, if not the, the arc here at the end, is what they were trying to do in The Last Jedi, but they blew it. Because... If you if you're looking at your one to one comparisons, if the Dominion is the First Order and Starfleet and everybody else are the rebels and whatnot, it's the same kind of idea where it's like in order to move forward from this, we have to destroy everything that came before so we can change our approach and move forward. The difference is that the Dominion is like a quantifiable threat where you know exactly what they're trying to do and why changing is necessary. But the First Order is just the empire yep. like there's no there's no weight to anything that they're doing and also th- what they're doing is no different than what happened any other in any other star wars movie yeah so there's not that feeling of oh this is a new threat that requires a new approach you know so right it, it doesn't it doesn't show you since the since the <clears throat> original rebellion succeeded why just repeating that it wouldn't work for this new group. right yeah 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 
Yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's true. Um I don't think I really I don't have a comeback to that. I mean, I I think that is a fundamental problem of the Empire and the First Order in the Star Wars universe, which is that mm-hmm. we talked about it in the Rogue One thing. It's like if you want to sort of get advanced politics into these movies, it's tough when your enemy is so vague and fantasy like. Like mm-hmm. the, the Empire is just an evil fantasy power. Um mm-hmm. and the First Order is well, no even- different. Even politics aside, you know, like it, it, when you get to when you get to the Last Jedi, you've got the First Order is basically the Empire on autopilot, uh, almost actually almost literally, um, in that there is nothing that is, there is nothing in their approach that is signaling that the answer is c- a complete status quo shift of how they deal with everything, right? It's just, I mean, they don't even have a Death Star in this one. The last one, they had a planet-sized... Uh, listen, I'm not going to get into this. This is not a Star Wars podcast, but... We did, but we you know did what I mean? cover that. Yeah. No, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, where it's like the the Death Star is is a status quo changing weapon, whereas in, uh, uh, in, the, in The Last Jedi, they don't have that. They just have a really good tracking system, I guess. Yeah. And so the the... All of the killing of the past and everything doesn't feel like it's as necessary as it is here, where the Dominion is a new threat that has massive status quo shifting implications and is and is winning. Yes. And so ev- in order to move forward, everything has to change. Yeah, because I, I guess to flesh it out, the Dominion are both enormous, uh, which they've kind mm-hmm. of fixed by shutting down the wormhole so that they can't get reinforcements, which fixes that narrative problem. But it's also... I completely forgot about the wormhole. To be honest with you. Oh, really? Yeah, that, that, that's why the uh, d- that's why the cloning facilities are so important in the Alpha Quadrant right, because right. if they can wipe them out, they can get rid of them. Um, and outside of that, they they touched on it more earlier in the se- the series, but the Dominion and the makeup and the nature of the founders t- sought to destroy the Alpha Quadrant by sort of like picking away at the liber- like the fundamental liberties that humanism has towards itself like in like liberalism and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So in their 9/11, you know, uh prediction, it was basically we will unsettle you enough where you will start to give up your values at that point and Sure. And it's it ties into the larger cultures where the way that the Dominion work don't allow a Klingon solution, traditional Klingon solution to work because they will just mm-hmm. run into the brick wall that is the Dominion as Gowron r- wants to do. So right. it's it's just a neat reversal of realizing your weaknesses, we, realizing your follies, and having the courage, I guess, to adapt to what's necessary to do to survive. Same with uh, yeah. Damar as the Cardassians. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, <clears throat> going back to the Mexican standoff scene real quick, uh if i if i had to change one thing about that scene i think it would be instead of holding the camera on demar and then showing him fire and then showing who he shot i would actually have him lift his gun up and turn his back and then see and then just have the firing sound come from off screen yep so that way i mean i guess it's like i obviously in that situation it's only garrick who's going to be able to fire the gun but uh, I don't know. It just it seems like I know that him shooting his buddy is is a much more of a statement. But I um, it almost feels like letting Garrick do it is a statement in and of itself. Yes, I, he, so, that, I, I think that's, I, that's a that's a coin flip. I think that's what's in, I think that's what I enjoy about the setup for it is that whoever pulled the trigger, I feel you know they put a lot of thematic weight on who pulls the trigger in that case. I, I can mm-hmm. also see the way that you set up that is it's the same where Garrick confronts the guy. But you see the shot from off screen before Damar officially announces his presence in the scene. So Damar shoots the guy, but it, it kind of comes as a surprise because you're unaware that he's standing right there. Instead of sure, instead of them being like Damar, help me do that. Like the the guy gets a little bit unsubtle with like Damar, like bring us back to the old way, and yeah. we'll do that. I think I think that's I probably think... what I don't like about the Cardassian stuff is that it feels a little bit more on the nose as to what they're doing because the characters are literally voicing what the stakes are sure. in that scene. Sure. Yeah, I I do like I do like having Demar have to choose between killing his friend and saving a, a Bajoran though. Yeah, because I mean, what what more what more distillation of a change of heart for a Cardassian leader could there be? You know. Yes. Yep. Um. So yeah, I I'm sure his buddy. You could probably take another pass at that dialogue and not have it be so literal. 
But um, I think the setup more or less works for me, I think. Yep. It works for me, too. I'll give my uh, – before we go to final thoughts, I'll give my uh, times orb problem with this episode. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they're on the uh, – Kira and them are on the ship, and the uh, Jem'Hadar or the Breen are calling in because they want to check in with the, the bridge. And they're like, oh, no. What are we going to do? Who can imitate her voice? Mm -hmm. where we just got out of Odo perfectly imitating the founder. (laughs) Yeah. I thought the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's a, um, and what's funny about that is Odo's in frame while people are talking about it. They're like, how are we going to imitate this person? Let's have Kira pretend to be her. It's like, well, just have, yeah. Have Odo do it. And especially since the next scene with Odo is him collapsing because he's been put under too much strain. Yeah. Like having that scene where it's like, oh shit. We need someone to impersonate this person, and he's and Odo's already fucked up. He's not showing it yet, but he's like already at the end of his rope, and he's like, "Oh God, okay, I got one more thing I got to do." Right, you know, and then he does it, and then he collapses. Yeah, I think that would have been that been fine. I don't know what you really, uh, what benefit you get from having, having Kira do it. No, Odo doing it, uh, weakening him at the same time as doing a perfect impression makes sense. I don't, I don't know what you get from Kira. Also, Kira, I, I'm unless little- it was like. Unless it was like they went to Odo and Odo was like, honestly, you know, uh, doing Vorta is actually very difficult. It's, I, just, I can't quite get the accent right. <laughs> did did she speak while I was in here? I wasn't paying attention. I was a little distracted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's I was uh, picking my I was picking my face up off the floor. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my only problem. It's not even a problem. I just thought it was a weird, weird thing. But let's uh, let's wrap this one up. Let's go to take a break. We'll play an audio clip, and then we'll come back, read some patron thoughts, and give our final thoughts about tacking into the wind. You're still a Cardassian, Garrick. You're not going to kill one of your own people for a Bajoran woman. How little you understand me. Put your weapons down, both of you! You want a dead too, Damar. I know you do. But you're the leader of the rebellion and don't want to kill someone wearing a Starfleet uniform. Let me do it for you. I finish installing the dampening weapon. Then let's all get the hell out of here. Not you. I'm still here, Rusat. Damar, shoot him. We can kill them both and keep the green weapon for ourselves. I believe in you, Damar. I know you're the right man to restore the empire we so loyally served. The empire we loved. Together, we can lead our people to greatness again. Just aim and fire. All right, so if you enjoyed the content today... That's really great. Thank you for listening. Thank you for enjoying it. But you could also support the show if you so <laughs> And if desire. you didn't, I don't know what to tell you. I'm That's, sorry. <laughs> it's not changing, buddy. We've done this for <laughs> hundreds of episodes. It's going to be what it is at this point. We are we are not like the uh, fe- the Klingons and the Cardassians. We are stuck in our old ways. Mm. If you enjoy the content, you can support the show at patreon.com slash the Penske file. It's the best way to do it. A couple dollars a month, you get extra stuff like podcasts and all that good stuff. And also, our Captain Tier supporters get a shout out. Special thanks go to... Andrew Turlog, Ben Douglas, Captain Cork, Cardinal Doomsday, Christian Michaels, Christian Pouch, Darth Moss, David Beardmore, David K., Dwayne Hackett, Eric Johnson, HH28, Yarp, Joint Mango, Jordan Cooper, Kevin Reyes, Cal Barrett, Matt Courier 6, Matt Cutler, Matt Ross, Mike Burnett, Nathan Elliott, Neil Brennan, Nick Sergi, Robert Cummins, Russell Owens, Samuel Custer, Grim Santo, Sean, Tark Latif, Tom Howells, Vault 13 Hero, and Will Yates. Thank you very much, guys, for supporting the show. It means a tremendous amount to us. And now we'll go to patron thoughts. If you're a patron, you can leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes when we read them. All right, Clay. So, Captain Quirk says, this is a great episode. I particularly like the theme reflected in both Damar and Worf's stories about the need to shed old ideologies and adapt reform-minded leaders. Worf's conversation with Dax really drove the theme home. The fight between Worf and Gowron is about as exciting as you can, uh, can get for watching two untrained middle-aged men dueling with prop braids <laughs> in a confined space on 90s syndicated TV. I was shocked at how quickly that Gowron busted up Worf's batleth. Makes yeah. me wonder about the structural integrity of that. They don't look super strong. They look pretty thin. But... <laughs> It's a it's a thin stock cardboard. I yeah. I always um I always think it's a little. I think they've portrayed Gowron as being a good fighter. He has to be to be the lead Klingon. Like you kind of mm-hmm. have to be a, a pretty good warrior. It's just his size that kind of betrays him a little bit because yeah. he's smaller. Isn't there, isn't there that episode where he fights like four guys for for and one of them is a changeling? His buddy's a changeling or something? Or is there? Yeah, so does he not apoc- fight people in that one. He does get in a fight in Apocalypse Rising. Uh, I don't know who he he fights. Worf in that one, I think. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So he's, he's held his own against them, but they 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 don't um, verbally go out of their way to talk about how great of a warrior Gowron is. Mm. When I think he should be really at that point. Yeah. Um, 
Nevertheless, I like the outcome and the episode served as a good endpoint for Worf. One final note. I saw this this morning as I rewatched the episode that Rene Abergenois had passed away. Mm. He was a fine actor, and the scenes in this episode demonstrate this. I can't imagine Odo having been played by anyone else. Rest in peace, sir. Point Extra G says, Kira and Odo both trusting Garrick with their secrets is pretty darn ironic at this point, based on how they used to feel about the guy. There's a character that has developed in... That's a character that has developed and changed massively since his first appearance, more than any other regular cast member. Damar is reaching the point where he has nothing else to lose. He's another great character with big development. Odo finally gets to impersonate someone. And alas, good old crazy eyes, I'm, I'm going to miss that guy. Worf has now had a direct hand in choosing the last two Klingon chancellors. Not bad for an outcast. Zim Nuclear Wessel says... Tacking into the wind, it works nicely with the title that all the stories have people acting against their side in the hope of helping their side. Damar kills his Cardassian friend, Worf kills the Klingon Chancellor, Bashir and O'Brien plot to trap a member of Section 31, and the Founder plans to kill Wayun. I do, I do, I do really like O'Brien's plan, because he's like, what if we lie, and then we trap one of them? And then Bashir, <laughs> Bashir, Bashir very astutely is like, what are we going to get from that guy? He probably doesn't know anything about it. And O'Brien's just like, I don't know. He knows something. He definitely yeah, he knows, knows something. something. Yeah, that's Could a, hurt. Um, there, there's not much to their plot because the next episode deals with their plot. But um, there's is another, like, really, my honestly, my big takeaway from this final arc is just that the they did the pacing pretty horribly for a lot of these things. Mm. And I think that they kind of stick out as that way. They are a, um, the show, if the show needs to span a plot line for more than one episode, it seems to have trouble giving them enough to do to span that amount of time. Um, yeah. yeah. Bashir and O'Brien are just kind of sitting around is the problem with that one. Like they, they have a couple scenes between them, but it's really just them debating about what needs to be done and being like, Odo's going to die. Damn it. And they go, Oh God. And he walks off and they come back and it's like, we still haven't found a cure. And then they hatch the plot. It's not, it's not really narratively interesting. It's just happening because it needs to. Yeah. I, you know, I, it's so strange to me because like looking at this episode from an, like an overview in it, of its place in the arc, I feel like this episode makes perfect sense to be where it is, even though the stuff before it was just sort of treading water. I don't know why, but it feel like if this was like the second episode of the arc, I feel like it wouldn't be super, it would be weird because yeah. you're doing so much big shit. That it feels like it needed five episodes to build up to this, but it was five episodes of not really building up to this. <laughs> right. So it's, <laughs> it's really it's really weird where it's like, oh, this is the perfect sixth episode for this 10 episode arc. But then you think about what the first five were and you're like, uh, yeah, I don't really know how the pepper sequences really led into the yeah. this one. No, 100%. Samuel S. says, one of the best episodes in the final arc. I really enjoyed DeMar's arc as he tries to placate both his men and the Federation. His ultimate decision to choose the Federation over his fellow Cardassians was poignant, as both he and Cardassia must move on from the past. On the other side of the episode, I thought the final battle between Gowron and Worf would have been more interesting if Martok had challenged Gowron and said, Martok seems too passive in the episode and had leadership thrust upon him, which made his new role as the Chancellor seem unearned. Four out of five. Um, no, man. It's got to be Worf. It's got to be Worf, yeah, for it's the reasons we talked about. I um, I had read that comment before, so I did. I think we handled talking about why it has to be Worf. The Worf is the mm -hmm. only Klingon who can not do the un Klingon thing in that situation. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Neil Brennan says, "Now that's more like it. This episode gives space to some of the fruitful pairings on the show: O'Brien and Bashir, Worf and Martok, Garrick and anybody." Got me thinking about the balance of enemies in the show over time. Feels like a long time since the Jem'Hadar were more than just background players or plot devices. It's true. You know, I, uh, I, yeah, this is the first real sighting of the Gem Hadar in a while. Yeah. And they're still just background extras. Yeah. Yeah. They're just yeah. guards. Yeah. You, <laughs> you get very, I mean, I guess it makes sense because of the reverence for the founders and stuff, but I just found it really funny when she, like, very, very carefully takes the gun from him. And then turns. Ooh, and then nice gun, it to Garrick. <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me. She has a. Uh, I I'm think, surprised she didn't do the thing, like the Bugs Bunny thing, where she's like, "Oh, looks like you got something stuck inside that barrel." And then he puts it up to his eye. And he's like, what? And I, uh, why do you, do you think it's appropriate that Odo is like, "Why did you kill everybody?" Um, that line always sticks out know. to me. It's yeah, kind of, I don't really of, know what the other option was. You got it's. It's a ship full of Jem'Hadar and a Vorta, and 
you know. And they also I, I they didn't kill a room full of founders. Him. I think like right. the Jem'Hadar right. are just cannon fodder, and the Vorta have died enough. Like you can kill the Vorta, and it doesn't really matter any, matter because they just clone themselves. So it yeah. struck me I strange. Guess you, I guess you have to have someone point out the needless violence or something, but he's the only one that would make sense to because Kira's not going to do it, and Damar and his buddy aren't going to do it. So I guess yeah, it's going to be him. I guess it's not. I wouldn't even classify it as needless violence. Like they, sure. they, no, yeah. they kind of have to get rid of these guys. It it just struck me as uh, weird that he would bring it up. Yeah, I, it is. It is an odd, an odd uh, addition to that scene. Definitely. I I could I could argue with him being pissed that they killed the Vorta. Not everybody else, but specifically the Vorta, because that was kind of like a. You know, I, you probably didn't have to kill her if you. If there was anyone you didn't have to kill, it was probably her. Well, if they if that was his point, I would expect a more pragmatic approach from Odo, saying like that him realizing that they could kind of use her, and then they get the call yes. on the bridge and say, yeah. "This is why you don't kill that person." Like I, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't buy his like feeling sad that everyone is dead, basically. Yeah, that, that's fair. Uh, let's see here. Norman Buckwald says, "Here's the way. Here is where the post changing face of evil conflicts finally come front and center. Both can determine one way or another the fates of the Alpha Beta Quadrant." Damar listens to Kira and sees where the Cardassian Rebellion must go at the expense of killing his friend. Worf once again determines the future of the Klingon Empire when he sees that Martok will not challenge Gowron. Kira and Odo's relationship succeeds once again because of the two's bond they always really had, and her time with him suffering was touching and endearing. DS9 at its best. An even stronger 5 out of 5, maybe a 7 out of 5, compared to the 5 out of 5 of the previous two installments for me. Yarpy, with the events of the last episodes, it would have been interesting to see how Martok shapes the Klingon world after the war. They've been getting better at writing Ezri, shame it took them this long, and the actress is getting better as a character as well. I like Jadzia more, but she's pretty good too. Damar's Rebellion yeah. keeps... Oh, I was just going to say, the, the Ezri scene is so weird to me, because I thought that scene was great, um, but I don't think the first three episodes that we spent with them dicking around on a ship added to it at all. I mean, you could have just had, that could have just been the scene. Yes. Uh, based off of the beginning of the season and it still would have worked fine. Yeah. Or yeah. Based off the, the first episode where Worf is like, cheers, we're friends now. Uh, you mm-hmm. didn't really mm-hmm. need that kind of thing. You know why that scene works for Esri? It's because it's the only scene I can really, it's the only scene I think that really truly matters to the story where it's clear that Esri is a unique character. Yes. And not yep. just Jedzia 2.0. Mm-hmm. Because... Yeah, she she's she is giving voice to the theme of the show because in, in that she is the one person from all of these groups who is removed, who is part of it, but is also removed to a point where she can see it from like, you know, a thousand feet up. Yeah. Jedzia would have been pro-Klingon Empire. That was always yes. her characterization as being yeah. very interested in the Klingons and what they did. So it's only Ezri that could deliver that advice to Worf, I think, which is a good use of that character. It's maybe the only good use so far, but it's it's a good yeah. use. She was oddly unfazed at the fact that she was still part of the House of Martok, <laughs> yeah. which is that's like it's like after you if after you get divorced, you still hang out with your mo- your ex mother in law, yeah. kind of. You know, yeah. it's it's kind of weird. Uh, Demar's rebellion keeps going with the realization that Cardassia of old is gone. It was a great choice to bring Garrick to the rebellion. He's been severely underutilized in the seventh season. They also show how changelings don't understand solids, and especially not Cardassians, thinking that punishing the civilian population for the rebellion would make them more obedient. Christian Pouch says, I've seen reviews before which assert that Garon's character is unfairly maligned in these episodes, but I think Garon has always been a political manipulator, and this is the logical conclusion to his character. Ezri's speech to Worf about the whole thing is really good, and has been the case going back all the way through Garon's history and long before. The hijacking scene is great, as is Garrick throughout those scenes. Surprise, surprise, Damar is amazing in this episode. The loss of his family and Kira's words to him are really impactful, as is his realization later that his Cardassia is gone. In a way, Damar parallels Worf. They both realize the fallacy of the good old days, and going back to them isn't an option anymore. You know, I think the biggest thing that stood out to me in this episode is how much tension I thought there was and how well I thought it worked, because I didn't know what was going to happen. Like, uh, yeah, you I seem don't know surprised. Was... I mean, you're obviously surprised by Gowron dying at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, based on the way these shows work, usually generally that stuff doesn't happen. And I think it's going into, and, and it's weird. Cause like going into, this is your final 10 episodes. So there's some finality involved and you know that at least Tom Paris is going to get killed. Is that who gets killed in enterprise? Uh, he's Tom Paris's Voyager. Oh, who's the guy in enterprise that gets killed? It's, uh, 
uh, trip. I don't care. Trip. His I don't name care. is Trip. I'm not going to be watching it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was all it was all a holodeck program anyway. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like if someone's probably not going to make it. Um, but uh, the I thought that all of these sequences were very tense and it worked very well because they were doing stuff that was outside the status quo. And I didn't, I legitimately didn't know how it was going to shake out. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that I I wasn't expecting Worf to get killed or anything, but I was also not expecting him to kill Gowron or anything, you know? So I, I think it's the, um, the, the fact that they are actively pushing forward is, is definitely a huge benefit to this. No, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of rot conversations in this. I, I really particularly like the Cisco and Gowron conversation at the start where Cisco is saying, yeah. like, what the fuck is the point of all this? And Gowron yeah. being like, oh, you're just loyal to your friends. And that's you don't actually have a criticism of what I'm doing. You're just uh, being on Martok's side for no reason. It sounds like that sounds like an Internet argument. Yes. A very good where <laughs> spoken in that tone too, of just growling at each other as they stare inches mm-hmm. away from each other's face. Two more comments. Cal Barrett says, an absolute cream cracker of an episode. Worth having to kill Gowron to save the Quadrant and Damar. Just an episode after, and Damar, just an episode after refusing to fight against his fellow Cardassians, having to kill a second in command himself are just so well done. I think Odo and Kira's relationship works particularly well in this episode, and watching that final scene after hearing the news of Aubergineau's passing makes it all the more moving. Although, my favorite that part of the episode may be the founders insinuating that she's waiting for the cloning facility to be rebuilt just so she can kill yes, Wayun. That was and, good. <laughs> and the kooky way she pronounces the word plasma is pretty great too. How well, does she say plasma? I, I rewatched it because I, I didn't remember, and she does say it in a very funny way, but I can't remember for the life of me so about what? how she says it. Um Plas- plasma or something? She, she says something like it's. I think it's. I, I'm pretty sure it's like an emphasis on the wrong syllable. It's, she's like it's a plasma or something like that. She says it very. <laughs> she says it very strangely. Will Yates, final comment. This is my favorite episode in the story arc. Uh, the Odo and Kira relationship is so well served in this, but I think that Kira saying she knew all along kind of gutted Kira's sacrifice and Odo's dignity. Damar's change from the old to new Cardassian is still pretty cold-blooded. The Klingon fight was all right, but I found Gowron's death a little bit ridiculous. I'm also very glad they didn't go down the hipster Chancellor rabbit hole. Lucky that Kayless had a saying to go with this situation, though. All in all, still one of my favorites. Thank you, I can't, I can't um, confirm or deny that I'm going to steal that Kayless sailing, saying and put it in my book, by the way. What is that so, Kayless thing? Uh, great men do not seek power. They have power thrust upon them. Oh, I don't, yeah. it's not yeah. like I wrote it down or anything, uh, just in <laughs> case I wanted to use it, but <clears throat> Kalis, uh, yeah, I, I even like the use of Kalis in this, the argument of Kalis, uh, he's Kalis is not a member of the high family and his response is with well, Kalis is divine and I'm not, I, I think it works really well with the, uh, themes of the series and everything. Mm. Good episode. Thank you patrons for writing in, leaving your comments. Thank you for supporting the show. Clay, what are you going to give this one? Tacking into the wind on our scale of one to five. Uh, two. Okay, moving on. We're done with the. <laughs> we're done with this episode. I'll give it a one just to balance out Clay's mm-hmm. optimism for this one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you actually going to give it a five? You sound fairly positive yes. on it. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna. I'm very much going to give it a five. Yeah. Okay. I. I think. I think. Mm, is it a five for me? It's such. It's a five. All of all of your all of your uh, uh, complaints about it were based on the previous episodes and not this episode itself. They are. Here, here's my here's my counter. I guess with that, I, I view this one as much more important to the to the series and the franchise than it is as an episode that stands alone on itself. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's good. It's just if I was making a list, would this be a top like top episode? Probably. I think that I, I, I think it I is, have to give it a five just because I want to give one of the final arcs a five, I think. And I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure this is going to be the best one out of all of them. Um, I, I think that you can, you could theoretically take points away because it is not a standalone episode. Like, I don't know if you could, if you put, if you across five series of Star Trek, if you pick 10 episodes to show people, I don't know if this would be a good choice because they're not going to know what the hell's going on. Well, you know what it's very similar to is all good things, which we get, which I give a five just because of how great of a finale it is, but it's not, sure. it's not a five on its own. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I think sometimes exceptions can be made. Yeah. Context and matters. I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The con, the context of this episode is just, it's five all the way. 
That's true. I think you've convinced me. I'll give I'll give it a five as well. Um, I do enjoy not this ch- one. It's the the pinnacle of the finale arc. I think. You know, not to jump back to I know we're on our way out, but I was just thinking about it. Uh, what's happening with this war? Shouldn't Wolf three five nine have had a similar impact on the status quo? You know what I mean? Like the 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 episodic nature of TNG hampers the storytelling to the point where they have this status quo shifting thing show up and then it's just like ah there was a battle we won the battle everything's fine now yeah i mean where, the- whereas after if if you set wolf 359 in the deep space 9 universe that would be just like a shattering event. Yes. It's basically the, the vultures are, would be picking at the bones at that point. Like the, the, the problem with Wolf 5-9, you think uh, narratively would be that the fleet being decimated that way would weaken them to everything else that's going on yeah. in the galaxy. That would be like you, you do Wolf, it's 3 five, nine, right? Yep. Yeah. You do Wolf 3 five, nine at like the, the end of the third season of Deep Space Nine. And then the rest of the series is basically how does Starfleet come back from the fucking ass kicking that they got. Right. Even though they won. Yeah. Or what compromises do they have to make in order to ensure survival yeah. at that now, point? Now the, the Borg are gone, but the Starfleet's been weakened to the point where now the Romulans can swoop in and, you know, they got that shit going on and stuff, yep. you know? Yeah. No, it's, an, it's, it's a like the, difference. The Dolph Lundgren Punisher movie. The Punisher was so successful in killing all of the American gangsters that they were so weak that the Yakuza could show up and take everything over. <laughs> Great movie. It says a lot to these trying times, these modern times. Yeah, we're both going to give it a five. Uh, it's a really great closeout to... Uh, I'd give it a five just for closing out Worf's story, essentially. like the, the, So this, well, too. Yeah, yeah so well. This, this is what it is. I like the Cardassian stuff. I like everyone else's role being reversed or like brought back to their former glory, talking about Kira Noto and all that stuff. Garrick's excellent in it. I'll give it a five. Clay gives it a five. I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening, guys. Thank you for Especially, the sorry, just what, to touch on Worf's thing again and how great it is the way that they've wrapped this up. The way that his arc, the way that his story ended in TNG is with him uh, not really getting to go out with Deanna Troy and then she dies. <laughs> <laughs> and then he and Riker get mad at each other for in the future. Yeah. You know, it's like it's it's that was that was where he ended in TNG. And here he's essentially shifted the status quo of the entire fucking universe yeah no that's, not, <laughs> that's true he has he's, he's had a impact on everything Worf changed everything for everybody which in a very a very warfy way only Worf could do it it's a perfect little close that to him i'm glad ron moore got to do it uh to close it out and things like that and it's a good episode so let's wrap it up here Social media links all down below facebook twitter instagram discord if you want to join the conversation discord is the place to go Support the show, patreon.com slash the Penske file, patreon.com slash the Penske file. A couple dollars a month, you get extra stuff and you support the show. Clay, do you have anything you want to say before we wrap this one up? Uh, we've got our season, mid season break Q and a episode of badass coming out pretty soon with me and Sean, where we talk about, uh, Sean talks about his book, curse of the white knight a bit. And then we do a Q and a, uh, of all your amazing questions that you sent in. So that should be coming out in a couple of days. And a uh, horror podcast with me and Amanda from Real Ripe, Real Rotten called the Rotten Horror Picture Show, which will start uh, early next year. It should be fun. Yeah. We got more stuff coming, and we'll finish up DS9 before Christmas, I think, if that's still the schedule. I think it is at this point without knowing, but I think we're around there anyway. And that Picard kicks off in late January. So thank you very much, guys, for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. We will see you next time.